A question I get a lot is, why should we bother studying history? Who cares what a bunch of dead people did hundreds of years ago? And for me to step up on my soapbox and give a hot take here for a second, I think this attitude comes from traumatic memories of high school history classes, where history is presented as nothing more than a series of names and dates on a PowerPoint that has to be memorized for the next test. I, however, believe that this idea of history lacks something. In reality, history is a living, breathing thing. Those dead people who lived a long time ago lived, loved, and lost just like each and every one of us. Their decisions, ambitions, and aspirations continue to ring down through the ages and affect the world we live in even today. On this podcast, my goal will be to share with you their stories in a fun and engaging way. So why should you bother with history? Because we're living in history's aftermath. Hello, and welcome to episode one of Why Bother With History. My name is Eric Akert, and I will be your guide on this trip through the world of yesterday. Nowadays, political scandals seem a dime a dozen. TV news is constantly filled with stories of corruption and acts of personal indiscretion on the part of politicians from both sides of the aisle. Talking heads on TV decry each new scandal as unprecedented, and never before seen in the nation's history. Despite these warnings, political scandals really are nothing new in American life. Today, I'd like to take you back to one of the OG political scandals in American history, those being the Petticoat Affair and the Nullification Crisis. These two major national happenings occurred under the presidency of one of America's most controversial figures, Andrew Jackson. Just before we get into the scandals themselves, a little background that's going to be important. Andrew Jackson was born into humble beginnings somewhere in what is now the Carolinas in 1767. Just before Jackson was born, his father died in a logging accident, leaving his mother, Elizabeth, to raise Jackson and his two older brothers. During the Revolutionary War, both Jackson's mother and and his two brothers died, leaving Jackson an orphan at the age of 14. Jackson, trying to rebuild his life, being alone in the world, went on to study law. And while staying in Nashville, in what was then the territory of Tennessee, he met and later married an innkeeper known as Rachel Donaldson, who was the love of his life. Seeking advancement for himself, Jackson joined the army, fighting both in the Creek Indian Wars and the War of 1812. Jackson rose to prominence when he defeated the British Army at the Battle of New Orleans. And what plays out next is a comedy of errors that could only occur in the pre-internet, pre-cell phone days of long, long ago. In the minds of most Americans, this series of events play out. Jackson wins the Battle of New Orleans, It's a great victory, and shortly thereafter, America hears that the war's over, a peace treaty's been signed. And so in the minds of Americans, Jackson is credited as being the savior of America. He won the war. However, the reality is a bit more complicated. The peace treaty had actually already been signed in Europe weeks before the Battle of New Orleans was even fought. But because it took time for the news to travel across the Atlantic... There was a delay in getting it, and so Americans had to process the series of events they had before them. In the years after the war, Jackson would build his legal practice and work to establish himself in the political community of his new home state of Tennessee. With his status as a war hero secure, it was widely seen as only a matter of when, not if, he would run for president. In 1824, Jackson allowed himself to be nominated. The election of 1824 was a monumental one 
because it was the first time that a lot of the barriers that had originally been set up to voting were beginning to come down. In early national elections, in order to vote, a person had to be a white male. That didn't change in 1824. But what did change is the requirement to be a white land-owning male. And so reducing those property requirements opened up voting to a whole new class of people. Jackson would build on this in the campaign, launching himself as a hero to the common man, fighting for the interests of the common farmer in America. In the election, Andrew Jackson and John Quincy Adams, son of the first vice president and later president of the United States, John Adams, emerged as the clear frontrunner in a crowded field that featured five national candidates. When the votes were counted, Jackson had won the most votes in both the popular vote and the electoral college vote, but he did not gain the majority required by the Constitution. As such, the election was sent to the House of Representatives to decide. The Speaker of the House at the time was the powerful and shrewd Henry Clay of Kentucky. Clay was the antithesis to everything Jackson stood for. He was from an old, established family who had used his vast network of connections to gain and maintain his power hold on Washington. Clay despised Jackson for his populist brand of politics and managed to use his influence to throw the election to Adams when it came up for a vote. In return, John Adams would name Henry Clay Secretary of State. This move would be termed by Jackson and his supporters as the corrupt bargain. Almost immediately following Adams' election, Jackson declared his candidacy to run for president again in 1828, and the stage was set for the dirtiest election in American history. Now, we're all pretty used to dirty elections, attack ads, ads impugning the credibility of a candidate, perhaps the candidate's family, but this goes way, way beyond that. On his part, supporters of Jackson portrayed President Adams as a corrupt aristocrat whose loyalty had been bought by the bankers at the, express, at the expense of the American people. They compared Henry Clay to Judas, who accepted his 30 pieces of silver for his role in selling out America. Adams' supporters, however, fired back that Jackson was unqualified and unworthy of high office. They published pamphlets, both decrying Jackson for being a slave owner, but going farther, claiming that when he was fighting in the Creek Indian War, he practiced cannibalism on his defeated foes. Yeah, could you imagine, just think for a second nowadays at a presidential debate, one candidate accusing another candidate of being a cannibal. Like... It would just have been a wild, wild thing to see. But another personal attack that was really a favorite of the Adams camp to go to was Jackson's marriage to Rachel. You see, when Jackson first met Rachel, she was still married at the time and was in the process of divorcing her husband. Jackson and Rachel fell in love and were eventually married. However, because of the legal process at the time, the divorce had not yet been made official at the time of Jackson and Rachel's marriage, thus forcing the couple to marry again once she received the official decree of nullity. Jackson's opponents, however, would frequently pounce on this legal snafu to serve as a ground of attack. In fact, attacks on Jackson's marriage to Rachel were nothing new. Famously, in 1806, another Tennessee... Uh, planter by the name of Charles Dickinson accused Jackson of being a bigamist and impugned Rachel's honor in public. Because of this, Jackson challenged Dickinson to a duel. Jackson also knew that Dixon, Dickinson was a great shot, and so his strategy was to stand there, let Dickinson shoot him, and then after he had been shot, to shoot Dickinson. And sure enough, that's exactly what he did. Jackson let himself get shot, he managed to survive, and then he proceeded to shoot Dickinson, killing the man. But now fast forward to 1828, and Jackson's star is on the rise again. And again, during this tumultuous campaign, Jackson's opponents would go on to label Rachel as a bigamist and a whore. Ultimately, however, these attacks would be of no avail. When Americans went to the poll this time, Jackson won by a sizable majority, 
more than enough to secure his election. However, this victory would come at a very high cost. Shortly before Jackson was set to travel to Washington, Rachel died of a heart attack. Jackson would blame Adams and his supporters for Rachel's death, and in many ways, he set his presidency up as an act of revenge against the men whom he blamed as Rachel's murderers. After being elected, Jackson appointed a man by the name of John Eaton to serve as Secretary of War. Almost immediately, this created controversy within the ranks of Jackson's cabinet. Rumors spread among the wives of other cabinet members that John's wife Peggy had, much like Rachel, had a bit of a indiscreet past. Like Rachel, Peggy Eaton had been married before she married John Eaton. Her previous husband died, and according to rumors, she, mar- she remarried way too soon. Rumors spread that Peggy was a prostitute, and that she had carried on, on she had carried on a number of adulterous affairs while her husband was still alive. In what became known as the Petticoat Affair, the cabinet was divided between pro and anti Peggy sentiments. Jackson, for his part, made his support for Peggy known wholeheartedly. He saw Peggy as just another Rachel, a good woman who was being impugned by high society. Also standing with Jackson was Secretary of State Martin Van Buren. Leading the anti-Eaton, say that three times fast, party was Florid Calhoun, wife of Vice President John C. Calhoun, who argued that a woman like Peggy was unfit to be included in Washington high society. Ultimately, Jackson would issue an ultimatum to his cabinet, accept Peggy Eaton or resign. Most of his cabinet members chose to resign. The tensions created by the Petticoat Affair would spread to other areas of domestic policy. In 1828, Congress passed a tariff in reaction to northern factory complaints regarding the price of imported goods. Northerners were happy with the tariff, but Southerners hated the tariff, fearing that it would affect the price of cotton, which was the lifeblood of the Southern economy. Southerners came up with the idea that they could nullify any laws that they didn't like, that a state had the right to simply ignore certain federal laws if it conflicted with their own interests, and they became willing to defend this principle. One of the main advocates of this philosophy was South Carolina's favorite son, you guessed it, John C. Calhoun. Combined with the already tumultuous relationship in the cabinet caused by the Petticoat Affair, the nullification crisis set Jackson and Calhoun on a collision course. The two powerhouse figures would go on to feud very publicly. One incident came on April 13, 1830, at a dinner celebrating the birthday of Thomas Jefferson. During the dinner, it came time for after-dinner toasts. Jackson rose and in a booming voice declared, To our federal union, it must be preserved. This was a clear sign he would not back down against southern threats to disunity. Calhoun, however, challenged Jackson, standing up and declaring, The Union, next to our liberty, the most dear, signifying that he found states' rights, not the Federal Union, to be the most important principle in American democracy. South Carolina and other southern states began to threaten to fight for the doctrine of nullification, threatening to raise militias and armies against the Union. In response to these threats, Jackson forced through Congress a bill called the Force Bill, which would authorize the president to take federal military action in support of the tariff. Jackson himself threatened to march to South Carolina and hang Calhoun and any other nullifiers from the first tree he could find. This would go on to set set up a long-standing tradition of presidents threatening to hang their vice presidents. Ultimately, South Carolina would back down from its threats of succession once a compromise tariff was passed. Calhoun, for his part, would resign as president shortly before the end of Jackson's first, tr- first term. 
Jackson would tap Martin Van Buren to replace Calhoun on the ticket in the election of 1832. This move was no doubt brought about in part because of Van Buren's loyalty to Jackson in sticking with him during the Eaton Petticoat Affair, particularly given John C. Calhoun's leadership in both the Petticoat Affair and later the Nullification Crisis. After Jackson's re-election in 1832, Van Buren was seen as being anointed as the heir apparent to the presidency, an ambition he would fulfill after Jackson's retirement. Ultimately, the legacy of the Petticoat Affair and the Nullification Crisis represents how two major scandals can intertwine with one another to create havoc on the national stage. No doubt, Calhoun's perceived disloyalty to Jackson and his willingness to spite Peggy Eaton and, by extension in Jackson's mind, Jackson's beloved Rachel, already set up an icy relationship between president and vice president. This relationship was only exacerbated in the nullification crisis, in which Jackson's staunch will was set against Calhoun's. Jackson, however, for his part, predicted that the nullification crisis wouldn't be the end to the sectional divisions in the country. Jackson wrote later that he believed the nullification crisis was merely a symptom of a larger illness, and he saw that once the nullification crisis had been resolved, the question of slavery would ultimately decide the fate of the American experiment. Jackson would ultimately be proved all too true. But that's a question and a problem for another day. Today, however, I hope I've given you something to meditate on. So next time a sex scandal breaks out of the news and you start hearing it be decried as one of the most shocking in American history, ask yourself this question. Will it lead to the threat of civil war? If you've enjoyed today's podcast, make sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you find your favorite audio shows. Don't forget to share the podcast with your friends, leave us a review, and remember, we should always bother to study history because we're living in its aftermath. For Why Bother With History, I'm Eric Agard, wishing you a good day and good history.